Can I get more of my guitar in the monitor? Can, huh? Guitar. Vocal, perfect. Awesome, thank you. Break my heart, make me more like you, not just a part. I want more of you, I want all that you have for me. Pour out your spirit and rain. Break my heart, make me more like you, not just a part. I want more of you, I want all that you have for me. Pour out your spirit and rain. Rain in. Rain in me Break my heart Make me more like you Not just a part I want more of you I want all that you have for me Pour out your spirit and rain Break my heart Make me more like you Not just a part I want more of you, I want all that you have for me, pour out your spirit and rain, rain in me, rain in me, rain songs out of nowhere. Um, the beat. The beat. Okay.
It's ringing in the skies like cannons in the night as the music of the universe plays. We're singing you.
sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so and he is jealous for me loves like a hurricane i am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden i am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and i realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh
good morning, everybody. Welcome this morning, and uh, glad that you're here with us, and Merry Christmas. Uh, some of you are going, who is that guy? He's actually in a suit, and uh, this, once a year, you know, once a year I do this. Actually, the last three days I've been in a suit, so uh, just by happen chance. So good to see all of you. Don't forget, tomorrow night, Christmas Eve, get her early, be inviting people. This place will be packed, and we'll have a great time. If you don't have any of those cards that are the invite cards, go get them and use them all up today because after tomorrow, you know, they really won't be real good for us. So get those and get them out. How many of you are visiting with us today? Visiting. Wow, look at this. You know, that's one of the nice things about the holidays. We'll, we'll do the, the standard disclaimer. How many of you are from Michigan? I know we have some over here. All right. You got out just in time, and you brought all this weather to us, didn't you? You know, yesterday evening, uh, Brett Allman got married on the beach, came to the Florida Keys. Of course, Brett grew up down here. I remember Brett when he was just a baby, and, uh, and I had the privilege of doing his wedding yesterday. I coached him in baseball all the way through high school. In fact, I gave him a baseball um, I wrote on the, on the baseball, may this be the beginning of the perfect game. And then I signed it and dated it and all the guys in the wedding, Josh, also his older brother, um, I also coached, Josh is here with the family, so it was a privilege, but it was freezing on the beach out there. So did you guys think, Josh, did you think it was cold? No, you were warm, right, okay, yeah, well that's, you've been away way too long then. <laughs> All right, well, we want, to, want you to just to uh, sit back. By the way, uh, the kids are going to stay in here today. Um, real practical reason. All of our workers are gone. You know, that's the thing about the Keys. You guys all come to visit us, and all the people that live here leave. So all of our workers are off running around seeing family and doing all that. So Super Church, we're going to make this sort of the Christmas service in here for us. But I want you to watch. This is to get us started uh, just sort of a different take on the Christmas story than perhaps you've ever seen. Let's watch it. My name is Alan Anderson. Not sure what's going on there, guys. Should have bought a Mac. <laughs> it is a Mac. Because God was kept. All right, why don't you guys stand up? We're just going to sing. We're going to worship. That's it. They'll get that worked out back there, all right? That's right. You can put your hands together. Sing it out, joy to the world. Joy to the world.
joy. Amen. All right. We're going to try this again. Go ahead and be seated. Let's see if it'll work. My name is Alan Anderson. The story of Christmas. One day an angel came to visit Mary. And the angel wanted to tell Mary something important. That she was going to have a baby. <laughs> Because God was good uh, to her the baby, she was there to get married to a man, Joseph, and he, he has a green shirt. So they had to pack up to go to Bethlehem. They got on a donkey named um, Seesaw. When they got to Bethlehem, there were a lot of people there. It was telling them, do you have any room? No. No. So they, and they're sitting with the cow and the lambs and the birds and the boars. They were in, I don't know what that one's called, um, the stable. Daddy and Joseph had to get ready for the baby. Making the cradle. The baby's born. And angels came. They talked to the shepherds. And they said that. To the manger. And they followed the star to go to the manger. Star. Guys walking on camels. And they were caught by his mommy. And they saw this big, great star in the sky. So they just started to follow it. They were bringing presents to the baby. And when they got there, they saw the baby Jesus there. They were giving gifts to Jesus for his birthday. I give gifts to people when it's Jesus' birthday. Happy birthday, Jesus. I'm pretty sure it was just like that in the Bible, so it was real, real close to that. So would you stand as we continue to sing?
the angels they sing, and the heavens they ring. Won't you raise up your voice, join the Son of the King, singing glory to God and peace on the earth, singing out now the song of the King. things that I absolutely love about Christmas, and I was just thinking about this, is that, it, it, and, it's, and it's, it's almost wrong in a sense, but when you're out shopping and, you know, doing the whole deal at the mall and all that, you can still now, and it kind of amazes me that you can walk into stores and you can hear Christmas carols still being played and hear Jesus' name out in public, and I, I, maybe I shouldn't be so affected by that. Maybe I should think that's the norm, but it's this week, I was just kind of blown away. I was like, I can't, I said, I even said it to Nikki. I said, I can't believe they're still playing Christmas carols. And I just, I love it. It just, it, it, I don't know, it just brings joy to my heart just to hear that our Savior's name is proclaimed still out in public. But that means that we have a job to do as the, as the body, as the church, that we should be every day just out there proclaiming Jesus' name. Amen? Amen.
right, be seated, everybody. I want to read a, a quick letter to you. You know, last week we, we had the chance to be the church outside of these walls at the same time we had services going on here. We had a service going on down in Key West as well for um, Project Angel Tree where we gave out gifts to uh, and had a big party for children whose various family members had been incarcerated. And uh, Paula just sent this, this note to me. It says, special thanks to the Derringers, Langs, Green, Dupree, Mann families for all the time and prayer and everything you did and worked together for all the, Lord good, for, for all the Lord's good. Um, thanks to Natalie, Amanda, Diane, and, and Maritza for wonderful love you gave to the Angel Tree families. Well done, good and faithful children of God. Again, a big thank you. And then a big thanks to ICC for all you did for Angel Tree this year. Um, this party was one of the best ever. The children were so blessed. The families were not the same when they left the party. Everyone enjoyed themselves. The gospel was given more than once, uh, extemporaneously, I understand. And Trevor, at the last second, was asked to speak and had to fill in and did a great job with it. Um, truly, the love of our Lord and Savior was shown to all. So, church, thank you for, for being the church and for doing that and, and for making these, uh, these kids feel really special. I had an opportunity to uh, know that some of you participated with another family and went out and just, uh, Colleen had the honor of taking a bunch of presents to a young mom uh, yesterday or day before, and, uh, you know, you're making a difference, and that's, that's just a, an awesome thing. So thank you for that. Now, um, by the way, you like all the gifts? You know, we've been talking a lot about the gift, and obviously this is the gift that we're, we're speaking of, um, and today I want you to think about another kind of gift, the opportunity we have to say, Lord, thank you for what you've done, and you know, you may barely have two nickels to rub together, and I understand that, and at that point you'd bow and say, Lord, thank you for loving me like you do. You know, I wish I could do a lot more. I can't, but here, this is my love offering to you. And then uh, for those of us that can, then we should. But it's a time to say, Lord, thank you for allowing us to give back to you. So let's pray together, and then let's worship through, through giving. And remember, kiddos, you're going to stay in here uh, today for the service. All right? Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for loving us as you do. Thank you for your gifts of grace and mercy. Lord, as we think about Christmas, uh, may we look beyond the manger, and may we recognize that... You came with an express purpose of dying in our place, paying for our sin, so that redemption and salvation would be ours. Thank you for that. And Father, as we give back to you today, may we purposefully pause and say thank you, Father, for the great gift and for loving us as you do. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the offering, guys. Child has been given the king of our freedom. Sing for the light has come. This is Christmas. Come and adore him. Bring gifts before him. Joy to the world. Worship the sun. This is Jesus, Emmanuel, here with us, tell all the world, we have a Savior, we have a Savior, we are no longer lost, cause He has come down for us, we have a Savior, we have a Savior. This is Jesus, Emmanuel, here with us, tell all the world, we have a Savior, we have a Savior, we are no longer lost, cause He has come down for us, we have a Savior, we have a Savior. His love will reign 
This morning, this morning I want to talk to you about something we've been leading up to for some time. We've been talking about the gifts, and you remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about how the anticipation of Christmas is just a big part of it, isn't it? The, the looking forward to that day and to everything that's going to take place is just, is just wonderful. And... Uh, Today I want to talk to you about the anticipated gift, the anticipated gift, and that's, uh, that's our title if we can get it pulled up here, guys. All right. <laughs> it's on the PowerPoint. Okay. I want you to do something. You know, last week I asked you to turn to the person next to you and talk about the, uh, the greatest Christmas gift, and I said, you can't say Jesus. You can't say that one. That's, you know, that everybody, we got that. But what was the greatest Christmas gift that you, you've ever received? And then uh, today I want you to turn to the person next to you. And I want you to just talk for a second about some of the memories of Christmas that you have. Think about, think about all the, the images. You know, we were, uh, Steve and I were uh, standing in the, in the back of our house because some, you know, a lot of people here have just helped tremendously in helping us remodel uh, do an extreme home makeover in the downstairs part of our house in the bathroom and a bunch of things. And I was standing looking at some things that needed to be done. And I was, Steve said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just realizing that this will be a smell that will remind me of this Christmas probably for your moment out. And it's, you know, how when you put um, new tile in place and drywall and, and that, all of that sort of the construction out of it. This Christmas will be associated probably for the rest of my life with that particular smell. Think about the smells of Christmas. In our house, you come in, and this time of the year, you'll smell cinnamon bread. Because Colleen will be making cinnamon bread, or somebody will be eating cinnamon bread, one or the other. <laughs> and you have the sounds of Christmas, don't you? Don't you have certain songs that take you back? to different times in your life that are just wonderful. That's part of why we enjoy Christmas so much. There are certain sights that we'll see, and it just triggers a whole set of wonderful responses. So turn to the person next to you and just tell for a second or two what some of your fondest memories are of, of Christmas. Go ahead, do it. You don't have to sit there and look at each other. All right. Did that spark some good memories? Let me show you a couple of mine real quick. I grew up in an area, in fact, believe it or not, I found this picture online. Let's go ahead and, and click to this next picture. This is, uh, 
Yeah, same picture, it looks to me like. Well, we're having some of the weirdest technical problems back there. You know something good is going to happen when something like this happens. You go, okay, the devil's working overtime to just try to screw things up. So uh, let me tell you what mine is, and then maybe we'll get the picture up there as we get to it. Um, we lived in southeastern Oklahoma, and very rural, very out in the middle of nowhere, near the Arbuckle Mountains. And some of you are familiar with the Arbuckle Mountains, very desolate part of the country. In fact, there were moonshine uh, sites and stuff still all around where we'd go out and get the Christmas trees. You'd still find some of the old moonshine areas. And we would pick out just the right Christmas tree just every year and pick it and bring it home, throw it over our shoulders. And it was such a cool thing to find. Did you guys get that yet? <laughs> kill it and there you go. I don't say kill it and start over. Um, good deal. That's the Arbuckle Mountains. And we would climb out in through there and just find it. And I remember some of the most tender moments with my grandparents because they're the ones that raised me. And I w and would find this huge, we had an old farmhouse that was forever cold. Some of you grew up in this kind of environment. You know what I'm talking about. But we would find this tree, I think our ceilings were at least 12 feet high, and we'd bring this massive tree in and set up. Now, you know, I was a little kid, so that tree was probably only about four feet tall, but it seemed like it was 12 feet tall at the time. But we would decorate it. Most of the decorations were handmade. Um, you know, the, I remember stringing the popcorn. Remember doing that? You guys that were growing up, remember doing that and putting it around? That's around your tree. And then a, a second one that I remember is, is this one. And this, I think, is, there's actually a reason I'm going to show you this next slide if we can get it to come up. There we go. Anybody, does anybody even know what that is? That's a quilting frame and a quilt being made in the middle of, a, of an old living room. And believe it or not, this is part of my history around Christmas time as I was growing up in the early years. Because you do it in this one room because it was probably the only room in the house that was warm enough where you, could, where you could do it. But I was a little kid, and I remember playing this game. And you've heard some of you heard me tell this story before, but it's, there is such an incredible theological truth to this that we need to remember. I would climb underneath the quilt, and I would be crawling down, lay on my back. And all of these threads would be hanging down, and it looked like just a thread jungle, a mass of gnarled, just made no sense at all. And some of you may have done that too. You know, from the bottom side of the quilt before it's finished, it's just a mess. And strings are hanging down like that. It was, I used to play, you know, like I was Jungle Boy, you know, crawling through the jungles and, and all of that kind of stuff. And then I would get a chair, and I'd pull the chair up, and I'd climb up, and I would look on top at the pattern that was being made. And then I'd crawl underneath and I'd try to see the pattern again. And I couldn't see it. So I'd climb back up on the top and I'd look at the pattern. And I'd crawl underneath and I'd look and then I'd crawl. You know, that's kind of like we are living in this world. We, from down here, life sometimes looks like a stringy, non-connected, disunified mess. You know, as you come into the Christmas holidays, how often do we recognize the fact that while we have great joy, some of the memories you may not it may have been flooded with were not all that pleasant. Memories of loss, memories of pain. You know, that's sort of like looking underneath that quilt. When we think about Sandy Hook and the tragedy of Sandy Hook, I heard Billy Graham speaking about it this morning. And, or the Billy Graham Association, speaking about it this morning. And he said, you know, it puts, it puts a, a dark cloud over Christmas, doesn't it? But for those of us that are Christ followers, we have to grab the chair and climb up on top and look down at the quilt and see that there's a pattern and that there's order. And there's coming a day when God will make all things right. Not that this was right. There's nothing right or good about what took place at Sandy Hook. We live in a broken, sin-filled, fallen world that God has came to, come to redeem and buy back and make right again. And, and that's really the reason I put this, this picture there. It was one of, the, one of my fondest memories of the Christmas holiday season. 
but I thought it had, it had very special meaning uh, today. You know, last week, I think it was, I asked you to tell somebody about the best gift, and then I also said, turn to the person next to you and tell them about the lamest gift you got, and then I said, unless it was the person that gave you that gift, <laughs> don't say it then, but Today, I want to do something a little bit different with you. I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell what the first really significant gift is that you can remember receiving some, from somebody. The first really significant gift. I mean, like, oh, I can't believe I got that kind of a gift. And maybe who it was that gave it to you. See the wheels turning. Okay, how many of you, how many of you would say that that gift, that first really special gift that you got, that it didn't necessarily have anything to do with price? Anybody feel that way? Yeah. You know, but you just, you knew, that the, what, what made that gift special? Was it the love that was behind the gift? Was it the sacrifice? Was it just something you had anticipated for so long that when the gift finally came, it, you were just overjoyed by it? Again, I'll show you mine. The first one I can remember, probably because I have a photograph of it, but uh, that's it. That was it. I mean, to me, that could have been a Lamborghini in the front yard, and it would have meant less. I mean, I, I don't know if you can see the, the pure joy on my face uh, as I'm running out to get it that day, I don't know how they hit it, where they hit it, because I knew every part of our farm, and they managed to stash this bicycle somewhere and keep it away from me. But the reason this gift was so significant was that it represented, for my family, it represented extreme sacrifice. It represented deep, deep, deep love. It was it was everything and more that my little heart could have desired. You know, you guys have heard my, the story up to this point about being adopted and all of that. So these were my grandparents who had really made significant effort to, to have the money and put the money together to be able to get this bicycle. Um, I'd been anticipating, you know, like every little guy growing up, I either wanted a bicycle or I wanted a... Uh, you know, you, you want two things when you're growing up as a guy, at least during this time and growing up on a farm. You wanted a BB gun and you wanted a bicycle. You know, those are the two things you just had to have as a kid growing up. And, and of course, you're about four years old when you start asking for the BB gun. And your mom, your mom, it's amazing that we don't have more blind people walking around in the world today. Because what does every mother say to their child when they say, can I have a BB gun? No, you're not getting a BB gun because you shoot your eye out. Isn't that the truth? So you wonder why we're all not walking around like this. But like all good mothers, my grandmother said, not till you're about 25, son. And uh, so that was off the list. Now, my dad, on the other hand, would say, boy, when I was about six, Go out and get us some meat. And he would hand me the 22 and send me out to shoot one of the chickens or a squirrel or a rabbit or something. And so, shoot the 22, but you're not getting a BB gun. I couldn't believe it. You know, they were so poor that this seemed so out of reach for me. That when I walked out and I saw that bicycle, well, you, you, I don't even have to describe what happened. I ran, and of course, then I got to it, and I realized I didn't know how to ride it. 
So my father, my grandfather, being a very loving and kind grandfather, thought he would teach me how to ride the bicycle the same way I taught my boys how to ride the bicycle. I found a steep hill. I took him to, they took, he took me to the top of the steep hill and turned me loose, which is really great because you have to have some speed to be able to stay balanced and to ride, and I could make it all the way to the bottom until I ran into something. But, and that's exactly the way my kids learn how to, to, uh, to ride their bicycles as well. But uh, I remember anticipating this bike and going, Dad, Mom, can I get a bike? And I can remember Grandma Hammond going, well, sweetheart, they're awfully expensive. Maybe someday, son. Maybe someday. And so it just seemed out of reach. And that Christmas morning, there it was, and I couldn't believe it. Well, there was another long anticipated gift that people had waited, waited for, not just for a day, not just for a year, but they had waited for it for centuries. And you know who and what that gift is, don't you? I want you to take a look at this clip Hopefully, we're going to take a look at this clip. And, uh, and then I'm going to come up and I'm going to talk to you about this long anticipated gift. And then we're going to give you a sheet to go with this. Let's go ahead and watch it. Born a child and yet a 
Now, the reason I want you to see that is because I want you to recognize the fact that all throughout Scripture, it's pointing toward this long-expected Jesus. And I'm going to take you on a walk through that in just a second. You know, when, uh, back when I was in my days of being an atheist, one of the things that really pushed me over the edge to convince me that the claims of Christ were real were all of the Old Testament stories and all of the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to this Jesus and to who he was and who he claimed to be. And so I want to just uh, walk us through that for just a second. I'll tell you what, guys, go ahead and get those sheets out, and uh, uh, we're actually going to be looking at those a little bit later. So when you get these, these red sheets, just sort of leave them, and I'll draw your attention to them in a few minutes. All through the Old Testament, we get these pictures or these glimpses or these images of the coming Messiah. Um, and a lot of times the people that were involved in these stories and in these situations, real events, real historical events, had no idea that God was orchestrating this in such a way that he was pointing everyone toward Jesus. To not get this is to ignore the very central theme of the Bible. Let me repeat that because I know you're getting these study sheets and doing this all at the same time. To ignore the fact that all through the Old Testament there are stories and they've been just pointing us to Jesus. To not get that would be to miss the heart and the intent and the content of what the Bible is all about. Never forget that the central theme of the Bible is the amount of love that God has for each of us. And he orchestrates that and lays that out for us through many of these stories. Um, let's go back to Adam and Eve. You remember where the first, first indication that God is going to provide someone to make things right? All the way back to Adam and Eve when he tells her that she's going to, to have pain in childbirth and she's going to give birth to a child uh, and that, that eventually a redeemer is going to come. Remember they had the, the dialogue that went on where God says to Satan, you are going to, to hurt his heel. He's going to crush your head. That was, that was talking about the evil one causing Christ to be nailed to the cross, but Jesus is going to destroy the head of Satan. Eve gives birth to her firstborn son, and in the very article that you read, the word the, in the Hebrew, it's an indication that Eve thought she had given birth to the son. In other words, she didn't see all this time span that existed between all of history that was going to unplay throughout the Old Testament and the coming Messiah. She thought this must be it. And so she fast-forwarded. And, of course, we know that the Messiah didn't come for some time later, and we know the whole fall and how sin was, was demonstrated through Cain and Abel and the sin that took place there. Um, then we get to Abraham. Now, we're going to skip all around here. So you get to Abraham, and you find he's an old man. He's long for a son. And finally, Abraham and Sarah give birth to a son. His name is Isaac. And God says, take your son, your one and only son, and offer him to me. No, a story that's, that's hard for any parent to read. And so Abraham starts out trusting God toward the mountain. And they're carrying the fire. They're carrying the wood. And Isaac goes, Dad, you know, I think we forgot something. I got the knife. We got the wood. We got the fire. But, but where's the sacrifice? Some of the greatest words in all of the Old Testament. Remember what they are? God will provide himself a sacrifice. God's going to take care of that. And don't you know the dad, when he said that, had a knot in his throat because he thought that his own son could be, and Scripture tells us that, that his own son, he believed that his own son could have been the sacrifice, but if he was, that God would bring him back from the dead. He believed God that much. And you remember the story. He's laid out on the altar. 
And Abraham's about to raise the knife, and God says, stop. And he looks over, and there's a ram caught in the bushes. And God instructs him to kill that ram, and that ram became the sacrifice, the substitute, just as Christ became our substitute. God himself, a sacrifice. And so we see that with Abraham. We see it with Isaac. Um, then we see, we, we see Noah in the ark. We see that Noah is, is one of the only righteous men alive, and he puts his family on the ark, and he pleads, and he pleads, and he pleads, and he pleads with people, listen, judgment is coming. And it says, the appeal was made, and the appeal was made, and the appeal was made, and finally, finally, God shut the door of the ark. That's something about the story that a lot of people miss. They don't realize. God shut the door. And the rains began to fall. There was no opportunity after God shut the door. It's a picture of salvation. The picture of the ark is trusting God, believing by faith that God's promises are true. Then we come, of course, to the Passover. The children of Israel have been in slavery. They've been captive in Egypt for generations. And now... God is ready to set them free. And you remember the story of the plagues and all of that. And then finally, the final plague, God says it's going to be death of the firstborn. But if you will take a lamb, an unblemished lamb, an innocent lamb, and you'll kill that lamb and you'll take its blood and you'll put it on the doorpost, I will pass over your household. And, of course, that imagery is, is so clear, so abundantly clear, that it's a picture of the Messiah who is, who is to come. Uh, so we go through the Passover, and the firstborn are spared. And now they're fleeing. Pharaoh has let them go. And Pharaoh changes his mind, and he's chasing him. He's chasing him. He gets to the edge of the Red Sea. Their back is up against the wall. Now they have to demonstrate another faith move. And most Bible scholars will tell you that what's about to take place is the imagery of salvation. And so it says, Moses stretches out his arm. The Red Sea parts, and the children of Israel go across to the other side just like we have to do when we are receiving by faith the gift, the life that's being offered us. We can stay and the enemy will destroy us or we can cross over to the other side, salvation through faith in Christ. They get to the other side of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army tries to go. The sea collapses back in on them and they perish. Now, it would have been just a short hike from there across the desert to the promised land if they had obeyed God, but they didn't obey God, so they began to wander. They got to the Jordan. Remember the, the faith move that they made. The, the spies go in, and the majority opinion was there are giants in the land. This is a scary place. We can't go in. And Joshua and Caleb came back and said, yep, that's true, but God is on our side, and this place is a land flowing with milk and honey, and the grapes are this big. Let's go. And, uh, and the majority vote won, and so they didn't go. So what did they do? They wandered around the wilderness for 40 years. That, by the way, the Jordan River is a picture of the abundant Christian life. Cross over the Jordan, get to experience all that God has for us. Or you can, you can have your salvation experience. We can come and we can get warm fuzzies about Christmas and we can celebrate, but we can kind of do it on our own and we'll wander around in the wilderness all of our life. Or we can say, God, I'm going to trust you. I know that you're in charge and I'm entering into the promised land. And that was the offer that was made at this particular moment. So, we've talked about the Passover, we've got the Red Sea. Uh, one of the things that happened, remember, in the, in the wandering in the wilderness, there was a beautiful picture that, that most people don't get. You know, the children of Israel, if you ever, ever had to identify a group of whiners, the children of Israel were just forever whiners, the proverbial whiners. We know what food. You remember what they said when they were complaining about their food? We want to go back to Egypt where there, was, there were plenty of leeks, onions, and garlic? I just find that to be really weird. I mean, I don't ever think about longing and craving leeks, onions, and garlic as a steady part of my diet. They wanted to go back. So God gave them manna, remember? Gave them the bread of life. Without that manna, they were going to perish. And they, they said, but by the way, the name manna means, what is it? There are these little cakes that came down from heaven. They didn't know what to call it, so they called it, what is it? 
And that literally is what the, the Hebrew tra word translates out to. So then what did they do about the manna? Were they happy with the manna? No, they began to complain about the manna. Wah, 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 wah. We don't want manna. We're tired of manna. So God says, okay, you don't like the manna? Fine. I'm going to give you quail. You're going to have quail in the morning, quail at night. You're going to have so much quail, it's going to run out your nostrils. Doesn't that sound yummy? Have you ever eat so much or something that it ran out your nose? Not a pleasant experience. That's what God says is going to happen. But then they get thirsty, so they start complaining about water. They want water. So God tells Moses, Moses, take your staff and go strike this rock. He strikes the rock. And you remember what happened? What came out? Water. So they survived because of the water. So they go along, and several years pass. They start to complain again. Man, 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 we don't have water. We don't know how to trust God. We want water. And God says, Moses, speak, very important, speak to the rock. Remember that? So Moses, in his anger, mad at the people, instead of speaking to the rock, takes his stick, whacking it worked once, it's going to work twice. He whacks the rock again. Water still came out. But God says, I told you to speak to the rock. And because you didn't listen, you're not going to get to see. You're going to get to see it, but you're not going to get to enter into the promised land. You decide to do it on your own. You decide to do it your way. Then you're going to have the, that's going to be the consequence of it. Here's why that was such an important thing. When Jesus hung on the cross, that was the striking of the rock. From then on, when you receive his forgiveness, you never strike the rock again. You speak to the rock. God, I blew it. God, I've sinned. God, I'm sorry. You never put him back on the cross a second time. And that's why striking the rock a second time was such a horrendous thing to take place. You get it? You understand the imagery that God was painting with that? The whole sacrificial system, we don't even have time to get into it, but we dealt with it a few weeks ago with the, the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, and then the scapegoat. Remember how they would take the sins and they'd tie them on and they would, he, one person would take him, as they said in the Hebrew manuscripts, far, far, far away, and they would release him. And uh, that was an illustration of God saying, your sins have been separated as far as the east is from the west from you once you've received forgiveness, once your sins have been paid for. And so that was the imagery there. Um, Jonah is in the belly of the whale. Jonah's in the belly of the whale. Jesus even made reference to this, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale or the belly of the fish for three days. By the way, I think it was a Jewfish, but that's my opinion as a marine biology guy. Not, um, it was not a whale as far as we know. It was a giant fish. And uh, get the Pinocchio story out of your head. This was not old Geppetto. This was Jonah, all right? And uh, I believe that Jonah died, and that when he was spit back up on the beach, he was resurrected. And I believe that's the imagery that Jesus is referring to. Uh, I kind of think it's gross to think he had to stay alive for three days in the belly of a fish, by the way, with all the digestive juices working on him. And, uh, but out he comes. And of course, his life was forever changed. Then there's Job, the oldest book in the Bible. Did you know that Job was the oldest book in the Bible? It's not the book of Genesis. That's not the oldest book. Job's the oldest book in the Bible. First one written. Job uh, loses everything. For those of us that, you know, get to that point during the season where you just go, ah, oh, things just seem so hopeless. Job has lost everything, family, friends, wealth, everything, and his lovely wife says, well, how are you going to put up with this? Why don't you just curse God and die? Wasn't that encouraging? You know what Job's response was? I know that my Redeemer lives and will one day stand upon the earth. Wow. What imagery. The oldest book in the Bible, by the way, it's also the book that contains more accurate scientific facts than any other book in the Bible. And yet it's the oldest one. There's stuff that we didn't know from science that appears in the book of in the book of Job, on a fairly regular basis, it just makes you go, God had to orchestrate that. 
God had to be doing that. Um, but he says, I know my Redeemer lives. That's a picture of Jesus. He knows that. And then we get to, remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Isn't that a wonderful story? You know, they won't, they won't bend their knee to this false god, and so the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, has them thrown into a furnace. Remember that story? And it was so, the furnace was so hot, what happened to the people that threw them into the furnace? They got burned up. And as they look, as they're looking in at the furnace, they said, didn't you throw three men in there? And the answer was what? Yes. Then why is it that I see four men in the furnace and one of them looks like the Son of Man, a reference to Jesus, pre-incarnate appearance of Christ? Then it says, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the furnace, what did it say about them? You couldn't even smell the smoke on their clothes. They weren't burned. They weren't harmed. And, of course, the fourth one didn't come out. Picture of Jesus. How about Hosea? What a story that is. Remember Hosea? Mary's woman. Sleeps with the guy. Takes her back. She does it again. Takes her back. She does it again. Takes her back. She does it again. Hosea, it's just incredible. And God says at the end, hey, guess who you are in this story? You're the one sleeping around. You're Gomer. You keep prostituting yourself, and I keep loving you and keep taking you back. That's a picture of God's unfailing, redemptive love for us. Incredible, beyond, beyond comprehension that he would love us that much. Boaz, Kim's and Redeemer. Ruth has no hope, really, for survival in a culture, in a land that was very unfriendly to a widowed woman. And Boaz comes along and takes her. He's the kinsman redeemer. He's qualified. He's willing to pay the price. And he takes her in as a kinsman redeemer, a complete picture um, in the book of Ruth of Jesus and what Jesus is going to do for us. Then there's David. So many images of David and what David is. He was a picture of Jesus. He's described. Um, Jesus is described as the son of David. And many times David wrote these messianic prophecies. He had no clue about what he was writing about. If you read Psalm 22, he talks about the crucifixion of Jesus 800 years before the cross <clears throat> was even used as a means of punishment. Had no idea what he was writing about. Psalm 23, he writes about, what was Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Think about all that is going on there. David didn't even, I think, know what he was writing, and God uses him to paint all this imagery and to be the line through which Jesus would flow. Esther is a picture of this woman who makes intercession for her people. And without that intercession, the people were going to perish. Again, a picture of Jesus' intercession for us. By the way, we could do this for every book in the Bible. We're not going to. Um, Isaiah details over and over and over again. Talk about prophecies of Christ. Details his birth. It details his purpose in this life. And details the purpose and in, in quite graphic detail describes his death and why he why he came to die as our Savior. Isaiah 53, read that sometime if you haven't ever read it, and just marvel at what an incredible passage that is. Um, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, reveals that Jesus is acquainted with our sorrows. Job, or Joel rather, describes him as the hope for his people. Amos tells us that Jesus is to be the judge of all nations. Zechariah. The prophet that speaks of Jesus riding on a colt, of course, describing what's going to take place on what we call Palm Sunday. Malachi is the one who calls him the son of righteousness. So the entire Old Testament points toward Jesus as Savior. 
No mistake about it. If you miss that, you miss the entire point of Scripture. Jesus is the Messiah, and He is the fulfillment of prophecy. Do you remember what it was like as, as a seeker when you try to read Scripture and you try to sort all this out? And it, it just was really tough to get. I remember trying to read the Bible a few times and just going, I can't get it. And then all of a sudden you understand the imagery of Jesus and what he came to do, and you just go, oh, my goodness. Well, this morning, I want you to see, uh, actually, I'm going to show you one more video clip. Just it'll give you sort of a highlight of what we're going to do here, and then we're just going to touch on this, and we're going to be done. So let's watch this clip real quick. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He will be despised and rejected. He will be pierced for your transgressions. He will be opposed and afflicted, led like a lamb to the slaughter. He will pour out his life unto death. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. And by his wounds, you will be healed. So that was just a glimpse. That was all from the Old Testament, by the way. That's not something that was made. I remember as a non-believer saying, okay, I recognize the fact that there's, there's more stuff here in the Old Testament that's, that's obviously dealing with Jesus than I can deny. So the only logical answer is that if there, that much stuff could be written then the Old Testament had to have been written after the fact. They made it look like it was old, so they made it look like it was prophecy about Jesus. Now that's, you know, how as a guy who doesn't want to believe how the brain works. The only problem with that is we have lots of historical evidence, which I don't have time to get into today because this is not an evidence class, that the Old Testament was written long before the time of Christ, or when it was said it was to have been written. Uh, a guy named King Ptolemy Philadelphus ordered the translation from Hebrew into Latin, where we get the Vulgate Bible, and that was completed before the birth of Jesus by a couple of hundred years, you see. So we know factually that the Old Testament predates Jesus. So it's not something that you could orchestrate. Um, just very quickly, you know, we, we looked um, at the passage in the book of Genesis. Let's go ahead and throw that slide up. This just shows you that, that slide. This is the one that I told you about, about the offspring and crushing um, Satan's head, and he will strike Jesus' heel. Throughout the Old Testament, there's this promise of Christ coming from a specific line. And if you look at your study sheet... Um, you'll see that. I've given you several examples of that and where it's fulfilled on that, on that sheet. Let's go ahead and look at that verse here. You can see it. Jeremiah 23, 5 is one of them. I'm not going to run through, have you read all of these. But look what it says in Revelation 22, 16. It says, I, Jesse, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Again, clear fulfillment that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Uh, one of the prophecies that really got my attention, is you've, and you've seen it a couple of times, is found in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. 
Now, I remember when I first started out, I, I used to hear the argument, well, you know, that word there really doesn't mean a virgin. And, and you know, should be with child and give birth. That, that really just means a young woman. Really. Where's the miracle in that if it's just a young woman? The miracle of this was a virgin giving birth, not a young woman giving birth. One young woman giving birth is a miracle, yes. But that's not what the Lord is referring to. He's referring to a miracle that everybody would notice. And that certainly is one that everyone knows. So it doesn't mean just a young woman. And the fulfillment, of course, uh, we're obviously aware in Matthew chapter 1. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus came about. The mother of Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, I didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had a mind to divorce her quietly. Now, does that sound like just a young woman? No. But after he had considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Just put yourself in their shoes for a minute and imagine having to try to convince the world of that story. You talk about unlikely. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, or Yeshua, the one who saves us from our sin, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Sometimes people will say, well, how do you know these prophecies in the Old Testament actually are what they say they are? Because you find places in the New Testament where they actually make reference to it, like this one. There's no doubt that they're taking you back to the Isaiah 7 passage and making reference to it and quoting it. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home to his, as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. That alone just really got my attention. I never knew as a, as a pagan kid, young man, that the Old Testament described the birth of Jesus to a virgin. Then there's the prophecy of the unlikely place where he'd born, and you've heard me say this before. This, this is about as unlikely a place as saying that the Messiah, the Savior, would be born in Tavernier or in Leighton. I mean, honestly, it was just a little... Berg, uh, uh, you know what its claim to fame was, surprisingly? It was a sheep herder's town. In fact, Jewish tradition said that the best flocks for the sacrifice, the purest and cleanest, came from Bethlehem. Isn't that strange? But look what it says. Micah 5.2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. I can't tell you how obscure that is. And yet in Luke 2, 4 and 5, it says, And Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem to the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. Just sort of an interesting side note. You've got to take your Western culture stuff, mindset, away from what was taking place here. You know, when you think about the birth of Jesus in a manger, you know, we think of this little wooden feed trough and all of that, and it's somehow gotten very sanitary and very clean over the years. This was a, this was a barn, folks, and the, and the manger, the, the, the feed trough was made out of a rock, usually. You can still see them there in the, in the Holy Land today. Um, you think about when they come into town and they say, do you have any more room in the inn? No, we don't have any room in the inn. I have some room out in the stable. What happened after that? Think about what's the next imagery you have in the birth of Jesus. Wah! Mary is holding the baby. You don't have any... We, we, because culturally, 
we see it one way, and what probably happened was completely different than the way we view it. Because typically, a Hebrew woman would have an entire entourage of midwives that would be with her, joining her in the birthing process, and the man was never allowed in the room. So Joseph was probably outside wringing his hands, walking around like, like a lot of dads did before we went into the... There was no Lamaze back then, by the way, in case you wonder. And so it was probably very different than we think of it. And then we sing, and we, we, Wayne and, and Trevor and I talked about this the other day, you know, we sing hymns and we want to, I understand the theology probably of this, but silent night, oh holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Probably not. You know what day it was? When God, when God chose to bring the Savior into the world, what day was it? Richard Overfield should answer this one. Tax day. Are you calm on tax day? Do you think the place where everybody was having to run and pay their taxes was calm? No, it was crazy. So it was probably chaotic. So I want you to just, you know, bring life into this, into what's taking place um, in this story. Anyway, um, to top it all off, the exact time of Jesus' birth is to be given. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Let's go ahead and throw that one up. Look at what it says. Now listen. It will be 49 years plus 434 years from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one comes. Jerusalem streets and walls will be rebuilt despite the perilous times. And guess what? That's exactly when this night, when this event was occurring. And then there's this one last passage I just want to go over with us real quick. Probably would just be ignored except for what Jesus did with this particular passage. And it's found in Isaiah 61. Um, and I want you to look at it, though, from Luke chapter 4 because this is Isaiah 61 as read by Jesus. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. Now, this is a big deal. This was his hometown. Everybody's anticipating the fact Jesus is going to come and speak. His parents are there. Everybody's there. I mean, they're anxious for what's going on. He was going to the synagogue, as it was his custom, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and, and in rolling it, he found the place where it is written. Look at what it says. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's what he read. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Can you imagine? Of course, they were, infuri they were infuriated. The family, remember, they came along and said, Jesus, I think you've kind of gone over the edge. And it wasn't until after his death and resurrection that his own half-brother, James, believed and then became the main leader of the Jerusalem church and it was the man who headed up the Jerusalem council. Why? Because he saw the resurrected Christ. You know, for those who are dealing with hurt and despair at this time of the year, for those who can't get past Sandy Hook, you have to look and say, Jesus has said, I have come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to recover sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that day will come. You know, Bible scholars agree that there are at least 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the promised Messiah, to the long-anticipated gift. On your sheet I gave you, I want you to look at that little last paragraph. I'll just give you the cliff notes of what that paragraph says. It says, if... You only dealt with 58 of the prophecies, I think it says. 
the chances would be 1 in 10 to the what? 1 to the 10 in the 50th power. Can you imagine? Or 157th power, rather. No, that's wrong. 157th power. And, and scholars tell you that if you get beyond 1 to the 10 to the 50th power, it is not going to happen. So the point is this. It would be impossible to stage the events, even five of the events. You know, if they said, okay, we want to make sure we find somebody that's born in Bethlehem, that's born of a virgin, that's born at exactly this time, who's willing to die on the cross later in his life, the probability is zero. My point is this, that Jesus was this long-anticipated gift, that it was like with my picture of the bicycle, it was beyond our greatest expectations. It represented tremendous love. It represented tremendous sacrifice. And friends, we can't even begin to grasp or comprehend the depth of the love that God has for each of us. And so very often, we just either take for granted or ignore that love because we want to do it our way. We want to be on the throne and we don't want God to be there. And that's just such a painful thing. You know, we wander around through life. We, we get hit with sorrow and despair. And without Christ, there, is, there isn't much to offer. There isn't much hope. But Scripture is abundantly clear that Jesus was who he claimed to be, the Messiah, that God loves us. You know, the thing that's so incredible about this, this love is that it's unconditional and it's irrevocable. So why in the world do we live like we're afraid God's going to take it back? You know, if you've not received it before, I want to encourage you to do so just as he painted all those images through the Old Testament, he still says, I'm coming back. You know, our, our hard part right now, the hard part for all of us is believing that he's going to come back and he's going to make things right, isn't it? Just to be real honest with you. Do you know from the time the Old Testament was written until the New Testament began, there was a 400-year period of silence. Can you imagine a little boy coming and saying, Daddy, did you ever hear from God? No, son. Didn't granddad ever hear from God? No, son. Did great granddad ever hear from God? No, son, he didn't. But your great, 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 great granddad did. And he points back to the Old Testament. Today we have the Old Testament then we have 400 years of silence, and then we have the New Testament, and the proof of the truth of all of that is the resurrection of Christ. And so don't despair in the waiting period. Don't despair. He says, I will come and make all things right. If you believe that, if you have received that, then you rejoice in it. <laughs> you tell everybody you can about it. And if not, don't put it off another second. You know, I, I found a picture and I just thought it was too graphic to put up. It was people down below the water around the ark with the door closed. And I thought, yeah, that's really the way it's going to be one day, isn't it? When God shuts the door. And that's a painful thought. I don't want anybody that I know in the water still. Had a guy this week, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. I was walking out of the grocery store. He goes, hey, i got to come see you. I just need to get saved. So we just started the process right there. You know, just pretty straight up. That's what a lot of us need. I'm going to lead you in prayer. And uh, just bow with me. I want to invite you, if you've not ever received this gift, 
at Christmas time. What a what an opportunity to say, you know, I recognize this as that long anticipated gift, the promise of a Savior. And today, I'm going to accept that gift. I'm going to open that package and make it mine. You can do that right where you're seated. If you just say, Lord, I need you. I'm not sure of heaven, but today I want to be sure. I'm going to put all my trust in you. I believe that when you died for me, that you were the one who paid the penalty for my sin. So I'm trusting you today as my Savior. I'm putting all of my hope in you. I'm tired of wandering around. I'm tired of living in pain. And Lord, I just need you right now. So I'm accepting you this day for the first time. If that was your prayer, I won't embarrass you, I won't call you out, but I would be honored to pray for you. And I'm going to ask you if you just put your hand up and put it down. Let me have an opportunity to pray with you and for you. Just hold it up for a second and let me see it. Thank you. Little one back there. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Father, your love for us is tremendous. I pray that for those of us, just occasionally we need to be reminded of why we believe what we believe, that we have an anchor, and that that anchor is strong and true and firm and will not break, will not waver. Father, thank you that your love will never fail, that you will never abandon us. Father, for those of us that are going through the season and, and perhaps doubting that a little bit, may you strengthen every believer's heart here to know that our Redeemer lives and will again one day stand upon the face of this earth. Thank you for that promise. Thank you for the assurance of that promise. Bless now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand together. We're going to sing. I'll be down front if you need to see me. Um, don't forget, 7 o'clock, Christmas Eve, we're going to start off with uh, a children coming up here. We're going to have the Christmas story and uh, just sort of a time of we're going to light the candles and do some singing and rejoicing together 7 o'clock tomorrow night right here. Thanks. One very exciting thing that we have next week, we are going to have open house for our new Super Church program. So right after service, we are going to register all the kids that we have up in the surf shack. It's right on the back side. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, go look at it. It's really cool. We're really excited just to kind of revamp some things and just to uh, just minister to these kids in an amazing way. It's exciting. It's fun. So right after service next week, we'll get them all registered. You guys got one more in you? You all right? Woo! That was kind of weak. I don't know. You guys got one more Christmas carol? All right. Here we go. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the place, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strain.
sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Christmas. Start attending here. I, I heard it, and it, I, I'm sure it's very difficult. Uh, what do you hear? Just that it's loud. Yeah. It's loud you? No, it's not loud, but it's it could easily overpower the, the right. other instruments. Right. right? My, I mean, if you need a drummer, let me know, and I'm happy to help out. Okay. You see, and, and when it's too loud, it's too loud. Or it could 
only be like when the when the flute is there in the front because yeah, you got to get yeah. definitely uh, a couple of tools on that because it is it's like you got to kind of get comfy with. Uh, uh, I'm actually kind of doing gear too. Well, I grew up here, but I played in a church up in Austin. Well, let's pray. I don't know if yeah. you guys are happy to No, just yeah, now. So, okay, yeah. uh, but I grew up here, went to school here, stuff. But I played at another church where this church is like a yeah. and it was you know from really loud, but they, they were hard loud music anyway. Right? Yeah. Basically, then just almost rim shots and yeah. ride cymbal on a thin rod. Yeah. But if you need a drummer, um, I can Thank you. give you my info and let you know. Okay. And, uh, yeah, uh, this is Jason, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, how long have you been coming to the church here? Uh, well, we probably came shortly after we moved here. We moved here five months ago, so okay. maybe four months. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you, you thought about church membership yet, but you might put that in your mind. I mean, just we, as we joined, yeah. yeah. Oh, you already did? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. I just I, handed the info to Jason. Did you just send it in just, just today? Yeah, yeah. Well, oh. I think we joined technically last week. We met with okay. them last week and joined. And okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Very good. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, just letting you know. Super. Go well, on. I, you know, when Trevor, Trevor and I are kind of flip-flopping, you, I'm sure you've been seeing that. Yeah, yeah. Because I've been doing this forever, and so it's good to get some new blood in here, some younger blood. And so he and I, I don't know if he's doing this next week, but I will spread the word. Now, if you 